Ladies and gentlemen, for those who didn't believe us, I give you Team Desert Taxi. Yes, it was my idea to enter the Mongol Rally. But I'm way ahead of this tale. The story of Team Desert Taxi really began with a call to Ed Moncton, who I'd met while teaching journalism in Serbia. Ed signed up Max and added Charles, and Team Desert Taxi was born. The Mongol Rally's requirements are short. No engine can be greater than 1.2 liters unless it had, quote, comedy value. That's where we came in. You are also required to raise at least $2,000 for one of the rally's official charities. For us, Mercy Corps, which I got to know while teaching in Mongolia in 2005. Mercy Corps does outstanding work teaching Gobi desert herders how to diversify their diets by growing vegetables, how to grade cashmere products, and how to build a business from scratch. In this nomadic culture where life is on the edge, Mercy Corps helps improve their livelihood. The race has no designated route, only a warning. You are entirely responsible for yourself. If something goes wrong, you have to get yourself out of it. There is absolutely no support or backup once you hit the road. The rally runs through some 18 countries, across Central Asia into Siberia, and through Mongolia's Gobi Desert to the capital Ulaanbaatar. That appeals mainly to the 30-somethings who are long on adventure, short on cash, and blessed with limitless enthusiasm. Our first order of business was to buy a vehicle. Our choice? This diesel-powered 1991 London taxi with 175,000 miles, which we bought on eBay. Just going to do a short tour of our car. As you can see, lots of space in the back. Fold down seats, air conditioning, intercom. Ed was a little generous. The AC didn't work. The taxi with its small 13 gallon tank was designed to wind its way through London streets, not across deserts and mountains. So we took it to Lenham's garage for a body lift. There she got new vital organs, an aluminum sled to protect the old girl's bottom, and some advice. This is, um, Andrew Axman, the man who has managed to reconstruct our old banger, hopefully given us a chance of getting to Mongolia. Um, so what do you think our odds are if you were a bookmaker? Absolutely zero. <laughs> Absolutely zero, of <laughs> course. If you gave me another 25 or 30,000 pounds, I'm sure I could make it so that we can <laughs> on the budget that we've been set. It'll be okay if you take it very carefully. To reduce expenses, Max and Ed installed other necessities themselves. They raise the exhaust for river crossings. They added a roof rack to hold our bags and tent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the roof of the taxi. Three jerry cans, two neon headlights, one modified exhaust, 10,000 miles to Mongolia. <laughs> welcome to the back of the cab. First of all, we have a thermostat to stop the engine braking. Radiator sealant when our engine brakes. Radiator hoses. So the taxi was ready for the adventure, and finally it was time. July 19th, Hyde Park. Ed, Charles, and Max joined 200 other teams for the start. Me? I decided to join them two weeks later in Turkmenistan, just east of Iran, for the big push to Ulaanbaatar. The boys sped 2,000 miles across Europe, enduring the long, boring, and well-paved motorways to Istanbul, 
where it was off to a famous Turkish bath listed as one of the 1,000 places to visit before you die. And to share this, can you identify who's who? Then it was across the Bosphorus Sea to Asia. Reinvigorated by their treatments, they forgot Alan Ackman's warning. Oh, it'll do 80, 85 miles an hour, but don't do it. Please don't do it. Approaching the Iranian border, Turkish police caught them speeding, but a passing Iranian stopped, intervened, and got them a discount. A group photo, everyone was happy. Throughout Iran, the taxi drew raves and waves and offers of home-cooked meals. Even truck drivers stopped to give them diesel fuel when they couldn't find any. Ahead lay the Iranian border. How could they suspect a problem? After all, they'd crossed 22 checkpoints with only a wave goodbye. That is Turkmenistan. And we are all sitting here <laughs> in no man's land. In no man's land. Now, the reason why we are sitting here <laughs> is that um, the Iranian customs officials seem to be rather more diligent than us. We've noticed that the engine number, the frame number, the chassis number do not match any of our documents. In fact, confirming that our car was stolen when we bought it. <laughs> a stolen car? Well, yes, the chassis number on the taxi was 75981, and the chassis number on the carne, 75636, not even close. After an anxious wait, the Iranians apparently didn't want any more headaches, so they told the boys to leave, and off they went to join me in Turkmenistan, a secretive, brutal, former Soviet republic. The boys picked me up in Ashgabat, where government buildings feature the photo of the new Turkmen president, who was the late president's dentist. We posed for our first group picture and departed at midnight because the engine could not survive the 110 degree daytime temperatures. If I look earnest, it's because I'm driving from the right front seat on the right side of the road. There were no street lights and no white lines to follow. Somehow we made it. We crossed into Uzbekistan where we saw Bukhara, once a major center of Islamic art, and Samarkand, one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world. Then it was off to Kyrgyzstan, where we huffed and puffed our way up the steep mountain passes, our radiator now hissing and leaking, but repeated fill-ups and a dab of quickseal, and we kept on course to Almaty, Kazakhstan, where we said goodbye to Charles, who was returning to London. Then it was 800 rough miles that claimed a headlight to Semipalatinsk, still a radioactive hot zone from Soviet nuclear testing 45 years ago. At the Russian border, guards wouldn't let us in. It seems Ed and I had arrived a few days before our visas became valid. Ed explains what happened next. Due to Russian intransigence, the team has been forced to occupy a quarter of an acre of broken land, surrounded by barbed wire and guarded by a Kazakh border officer wearing a very large hat. There was no water, no toilet, no food, and no shade from the 100 degree heat. The next day, I fell sick with dysentery and was evacuated by a passing Mongol rally team to a Russian hospital in Western Siberia, where I was examined, given a shot, and told the surgeon was coming. I bolted and recovered at a nearby hotel. Cut off from the world, Max and Ed made the best of the worst. They found and raised a wooden pole, placed the Union Jack hubcap on top, and enthusiastically declared the birth of the People's Autocratic Republic of Taxistan. Every morning they poked the bear playing God Save the Queen until ordered to stop. They set up passport control and established a defensive perimeter. Back in London, the injustice drew the attention of the Evening Standard and a rally outside Parliament for the independence of Taxistan. Meanwhile, Mongol rally teams stopped by offering good cheer and more importantly, lots of food, water, and a tennis ball. The boys finished their confinement, but had one financial pledge to meet. Supporters back in London said they would make a contribution for a photo of Max and Ed wearing mankinis, thereby killing any chance of pursuing political careers. Finished, they headed to Barnall, Russia to retrieve me. We stayed there long enough to repack, then head through the Altai Mountains to the Russian-Mongolian border. Next morning, we couldn't believe it, but there was Mongolia, stark, bleak, inviting. Just as we entered, five other teams caught up. One had a leaky fuel tank, so we towed it five miles to a Mongolian house, where we were welcomed with Mongolian tea, with butter mixed in, and goat cheese hard enough to cut diamonds. At least that was Ed's take. The 11 of us spent a cozy night. 
We took off by ourselves, the boys confident we could cross the 1,200 miles of the Gobi Desert without major headaches. My assignment? To worry. Team, there's a taxi first through a crossing. So you can see the bridge. So it is the river crossing. There it is. Fingers crossed. Come on, Edward. Faster, fast! Faster! No bloody problem. Flush with success but unsure of our route, a constant problem. We asked every herder we came across to point us on the right path. There were no signs and no single road to follow. Only the advice we received, when in doubt, follow power lines because they always lead somewhere. And they did to small cities, once way stations on Chinggis Khan's route westward, and now a little bigger with a hotel or two, though most without running water or working toilets. The taxi took a tremendous pummeling from rocks, ridges, and potholes. The problem was that each town sat 250 miles from the next, and therefore, the next mechanic. After bumping along for hours, we suddenly found ourselves face to face with Bactrian two-hump camels, they have survived in this harsh climate for more than 4,000 years, something our taxi could never claim. Sure enough, the boys' skills were tested. A fuel leak is plugged, a battery cable separates but is reconnected, and the exhaust pipe breaks off, no fix possible, so we lower the windows to minimize carbon monoxide fumes. Then the generator dies, and without it, the taxi may not start, so we keep driving. Our next stop claimed to be an official Mongol rally garage, which just happened to also be a graveyard, not good. They removed our generator, declared the taxi dead, and insisted we should leave it. We balked. They eventually found another generator, but then said we had a fuel problem. With that, the mechanic poured fuel into the top of the engine and set it on fire. The fire spreads to our air intake, and panic ensues among the mechanics, until the mother of the mechanic beat it out for the bag. All's well, no damage, so we took off. We persevere until our front bumper falls off, bending the axle. But even that got fixed, and after a harrowing all-night drive without lights, we reached our goal. The old girl stayed on course for 38 days and delivered us to the feet of the great Khan. In the end, we raised $19,000 for Mercy Corps and 5,600 pounds for Help for Heroes, which assists British service members wounded in Afghanistan and Iraq. Our thanks to our sponsors and supporters. Oh, would we do it again? You'll have to ask Ed, Max, and Charles. Me? Not on my life.